welcome back so uh, let us continue towards the end of the last lecture I, we had derived the black scholes equation working on the premise of the eto equation we started with the eto equation wrote down the equa uh, eto equation for the for a derivative keeping in view the uh, the infinitesimal model uh, or the log normal model as you call it and uh, on that basis we arrived at the black scholes equation which is given on this slide so now, if we solve this equation, there are a number of ways of solving this equation. We can use the green function approach, we can use separation of variables, we can convert it by coordinate transformation to the heat equation and then solve it. Uh, we can use any of these approaches, we can use Fourier transforms as well. In any case, uh, when we solve this equation using the boundary conditions which we have on this slide, basically these boundary conditions represent the fact that on the date of maturity of the option, we please note we are talking about European options. On the date of maturity of the options, the value of the option must equal its payoff. That is what is represented by equation number 1 in the case of a call, European call and equation number 2 in the case of a European put. Uh, when this uh, Black Scholes equation is solved with these boundary conditions, what we arrive at as the uh, solutions are given on this slide. C is equal to S naught capital Phi of D 1 minus K e to the power minus R T Phi of T 2 and similarly for the put option, put option uh, is equal to uh, the value of the put option is equal to K e to the power minus R T Phi of minus D 2 minus S naught Phi of minus D 1, where D 1 and D 2 are defined by equations 1 and 2 respectively. Please note R is the risk free rate, uh, rate of return in this equation, sigma is the volatility, time is the term to maturity, S naught is the current price of the underlying asset and K is the excise price, the strike price of the option. Uh, in the case of uh, uh, see now the whatever derivations have uh, been done so far have been done on the premise that the underlying asset pays no income during the lifetime of the option. If you recall the case of the forward contracts or the case of uh, options when we talked about put call parity of options, when there is a dividend payout uh, envisaged during the life of the options, the formulas get modified by the fact that S naught which is the current stock price gets replaced by S naught minus D naught everywhere where uh, D naught is the present value of the dividend payment. That is precisely what is done in this slide and D 1 and D 2 also change and so do the uh, values of C and P. In the case of options on indices when we have a continuously compounded return uh, uh, on the underlying asset during the life of the option, during the term of the option, we have this additional factor Q coming into play uh, as you can see when we calculate D 1 and D 2. Uh, so, these are variations of uh, uh, the Black Scholes formula in relation to various types of options. Similarly, for options on currencies, the factor Q that I talked about just now is replaced by RF, where RF is the foreign uh, rate of interest. Now, let us do an example. A stock price follows geometric Brownian motion with an expected return of 16 percent and a volatility of 35 percent. The current price is 38. What is the probability that a European call option on the stock with an excise price of 40 and a maturity date in 6 months will be exercised? So, expected return mu is equal to 16 percent, volatility is equal to 35 percent and the current price is 38, the excise price is 40, the option is a call option and the maturity is 6 months. So, this is the data that is given to us. Now, obviously, an option will be exercised when the price on the date of maturity of the option in the case of a European option on the date of maturity of the option exceeds the strike price. So, in other words given the data that I have just uh, elucidated, we need to find out the probability that the stock price will be greater than 40 as on the date of maturity of the option that is in 6 months time. But we know that log of S t is normally distributed with a mean uh, equal to log of S naught plus mu minus sigma square upon 2 into t and a variance of sigma square into t. So, we are given all the uh, information on all the parameters, we use that information and what we find is that 
log of S T, where uh, S T is the price of the uh, stock as on uh, the date of maturity of the option, S T is the price of the stock as on date of maturity of the option is normally distributed with a mean of 3.687 and a variance of 0.247 square that is the standard deviation is equal to 0.247. Now, we need to find the probability of the stock finishing greater than 40. For that purpose, we work out the log of 40 and that is found, that is found out to be 3.687. Uh, 689. Now, using the three figure of 3.689 and the mean and standard deviation of the distribution, we can calculate the z value. The z value turns out to be equal to 0 0.008 as you can see on the slide and therefore, we need to find the probability that the standard normal variate is, is takes a value greater than 0 0.008. This can be done using the uh, normal distribution tables and we find the probability to be 0 0.4968. So, this is an illustration of the uh, use of uh, uh, the log normal property of stock prices. Now, I present on this slide three important results. I will not get into the proof of these results for the paucity uh, on account of the paucity of time shortage of time that we have in this course, but uh, I will put it them in the in the powerpoint in that accompany this uh, course as well as in the notes uh, which will be circulated along with this course for the benefit of learners. I would also strongly recommend that if the learners could study uh, from the course on financial derivatives that was run by me on the net uh, NPTEL pr platform a couple of years ago. Uh, all the proofs of all these results uh, uh, together with the solution of the Black Scholes equations, the derivation of the Fokker Planck equation and its solution, all these things are dealt with in considerable detail in that course on financial derivative and uh, risk management that was run on the NPTEL platform a couple of years ago. So, these are three results. Uh, first result is the probability of excess of the call option in risk neutral world that is given by phi d 2 when you work it out uh, probability of S t greater than k because that is only when the option will be excised um, that is obviously equal to probability of log S t greater than log k because uh, a logarithm is a monotonic function of the uh, argument and therefore, what we have is uh, probability of S t greater than k which is the probability of exercise of the call option is equal to probability log S t is greater than log k and which can be worked out to be equal to phi of d 2 capital phi of d 2. Please note capital phi represents the cumulative normal distribution. Delta value uh, you recall we constructed a uh, delta neutral hedge a risk less portfolio consisting of one unit of the derivative and delta units of the underlying asset. When we work out the delta value using the Black Scholes solution what we find is that delta value is equal to phi of d 1 this is the second important result. And the third important result is the conditional expectation of stock price subject to call exercise is equal to S naught e to the power r t phi of d 1. Let me repeat conditional expectation of stock price subject to call exercise that is given by this equation. It considers or it is the expectation calculated with reference to the all the values of the stock price which are greater than the excess price, the expected value of all the values of the stock price subject to the condition that those values of the stock price are greater than or equal to k and that turns out to be equal to S naught e to the power r t phi of d 1. So, these are three important results which can be derived from the Black Scholes equation. We shall make use of these results in bringing to you an interpretation of the uh, Black Scholes equation. I will try to show by virtue of explaining this interpretation that the Black Scholes equation is consistent with the principles of finance. For that purpose, let us now move on to the interpretation. Uh, now, we have seen uh, particularly when I talked about the binomial model of calculating uh, the value of an option that the value of a call is equal to the present value of the expected 
payoff from the option that expected value being calculated the reference to risk neutral probabilities that is what is given by this expression here which I have underlined e to the power minus r t e q q is the uh, probability measure representing risk neutral probabilities f of S t f of S t represents the payoff from the derivative which is obviously a function of S t where S t is the stock price at maturity. Now, in the case of a call option f of S t is equal to maximum of S t minus k comma 0. So, I can substitute f of S t by the expression that I have underlined maximum of S t minus k comma 0. In the black shows model we uh, this is the equation that we arrive at for c. So, we need to show that the two results that I have here number 1 let us call it number 1 the first equation and let us call that equation number 2. Let us uh, we need to show that equation number 1 and 2 are mutually consistent firstly and secondly they are consistent with the fundamental principles of finance. Now, the first component of the payoff at capital T please note capital T is the date of maturity of the call option please also note that we are talking about European options. So, C 1 of at time t is equal to S t this is the first component of the payoff and the second component of the payoff is minus k. So, we write it as C 2 of at capital T that is equal to minus k. So, there are two components of the payoff from the of from the derivative from the call option uh, first component is S t and the second component is k. Now, let us con, uh, let us uh, restrict ourselves to the first component for the moment. The first component is given by C 1 uh, or at time t that is equal to S t. This S t will be paid if the option finishes in the money that is if S t is greater than k. If S t is greater than k then this this component of money will materialize. However, if S t is less than k then this component of money will not materialize and this is a contingent payoff which can be represented by the equation that we have here let us call it equation number 1. C 1 at capital T is equal to S t if S t is greater than equal to k and 0 otherwise. So, therefore, the expected value of C 1 uh, capital T is given by the expression that we have here E of C 1 capital T that is e equal to E of S T subject to S T is greater than equal to K plus 0 because if S T is less than equal to K then the payoff is 0 into probability that S T is less than K. So, this we have this part we have already worked out or the, this is the part of the results that I showed on the previous slide the third result and that is equal to e to the power r t s naught pi of d 1. In other words the present value of this component is equal to s naught phi of d 1. Now, let us move to the second component. The second component of the payoff is minus k this is C 2 at time t. This will be paid if the option finishes in the money. Hence, just like the first component we can write this component as a contingent payoff C 2 t is equal to minus k if S t is greater than equal to k and is equal to 0 otherwise. The ex therefore, the expected value of the second component is worked out as minus k into probability that S t is greater than equal to k plus 0 into probability that S t is less than uh, k. Now, the probability S t is greater than equal to k we have already worked out this was result number 1 and we found that it was equal to capital phi of d 2. So, we get from this expression we get that expected value of the second component at time t is equal to minus k into capital phi of d 2. In other words the present value of this component will be equal to minus k e to the power minus r t into phi of d 2. So, this is the present value of the second component. Therefore, the black shows formula which can be written as the expression that we have here equation number 1 here on the slide. You can see here this can be written as the present value of e of C 1 t minus e of C t 2 C 2 at time t this should be C 2 here. So, p uh, present value of e of C 1 t minus e of C 2 t that is equal to present value of e of 
सी सी वन टी माइनस सी टू टी सी वन टी माइनस सी टू टी एंड दैट इज इक्वल टू प्रेजेंट वैल्यू ऑफ नेट कैश फ्लो फ्रॉम द ऑप्शन सो विच शोज दैट दिस फॉर्मूला इज कंसिस्टेंट विद द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ फाइनेंस द वैल्यू ऑफ द डेरीवेटिव इज इक्वल टू द प्रेजेंट वैल्यू ऑफ द नेट एक्सपेक्टेड कैश फ्लो फ्रॉम द ऑप्शन प्लीज नॉट द वर्ड एक्सपेक्टेड दिस एक्सपेक्टेशन ऑपरेटर इज देयर सो what we find is that uh, the value of the call option as per the black scholes model is equal to the present value of the expected net cash flow from the option which is as it should be now there is another interpretation to the black scholes formula black scholes solution let us assume that you write a call option then you create an obligation to honor the call if the option holder decides to exercise the option you are the writer of the option so Uh, in the uh, you have the obligation to honor your leg of the uh, option if the holder of the option decides to exercise the option however you can cover this risk exposure and maintain your riskless position by taking a long position in delta units of the stock this is this was the fundamental principle you may recall on the basis of which we did the valuation both in the binomial model and the black scholes model we can create a riskless portfolio comprising of a position in the derivative and an opposite position in the underlying asset that is precisely what is being said here so we because we are short in the option we'll take a long position in the underlying asset how much that is equal to delta where delta is equal to the partial of c and please note c is the premium or the price of the call option european call and this we know this part we know from the uh, results that we discussed a few minutes back that the delta of the option is equal to phi of d1 now in other words by creating a portfolio consisting of a short call and long delta units of the strong uh, stock you create a riskless portfolio and hence your overall risk position is unaffected however buying delta units of the stock entails an expenditure that expenditure is equal to delta into s0 that is equal to s0 into capital phi of d1 this cash flow occurs at t equal to 0 against this you have the possibility of receiving the exercise price k on the date of maturity now there are two things here as i mentioned k would be received by the uh, by the option writer at maturity hence the amount that is relevant when you are valuing the option uh, at an earlier date is the present value of k that is equal to k e to the power minus rt and the second thing is that you will receive this amount k only if the option is exercised and the probability of the exercise of the option uh, we worked out is equal to phi of t2 so the relevant amount that needs to be considered when we are valuing the option at t equal to 0 is equal to k e to the power minus rt phi of d2 so the net value of the option to the writer is what he is going to receive that is equal to k e to the power minus rt phi of d2 minus s not phi of d1 which is his obligation against the option and this is equal to minus c because it, this valuation is done from the perspective of the option writer so this is another perspective this is another interpretation of the black scholes model then on this slide as you know as you when we talked about the binomial model uh, we uh, derived the expression for the by, uh, for the value of the option on uh, two counts number 1 by constructing a riskless portfolio and number 2 by risk neutral valuation uh, in this slide i gave you the risk neutral approach to the uh, to the black scholes model or the black scholes formula for the european call and you can see here that this uh, uh, this is also consistent with the with the black scholes model that we arrived at using the delta approach using the arbitrage free approach using the uh, construction of a riskless portfolio approach the calculations are pretty elementary pretty straightforward we have made use of the three results that i have mentioned at the beginning of today's class and we arrive at the result which is which is exactly the same as the black scholes model now we move on to this is uh, all i have to offer in the context of options uh, i i reiterate my request to the learners to please go through or to please supplement 
uh, the material that is given in this course with the material that is covered in the course on financial derivatives under the NPTEL uh, program. All these things which I have meant, so which I have summarized in this particular course in so far as they pertain to derivatives are dealt with in considerable detail. It is a 12 week course and therefore, all these issues are dealt with in considerable detail in that particular course. So, that will provide you excellent supplementary material. I will also try to uh, circulate transcripts of that course uh, with the learners uh, uh, who are enrolled for this course. Anyway, so now we move on to the next topic that is futures. So, what are financial futures? Uh, what are financial futures? Financial futures are agreement to buy or sell an asset for a certain price at a certain time just like the forward contract. So, as far as this feature is concerned they emulate or they are similar to the forward contracts. So, that is what we say they are similar to forward contracts. They have a linear payoff function which is given by this expression as you can see. F naught is the price that is contracted at t equal to 0 when you take a position in the futures contract. S t is the price uh, as on of the stock of the underlying asset as on the date of maturity of the futures. Therefore, the payoff is equal to S t minus F naught from the perspective of the party who is long in the futures contract. This is where we move away from the concept of forwards. This is what this is the fundamental feature that distinguishes or discriminates between the forward contracts and the futures contract. Futures contracts are traded on an appropriate exchange uh, or exchanges for that matter whereas, forward contracts are private contracts between parties. So, that is the fundamental difference between the two types of instruments. A prerequisite of exchange tradability is that the futures contract must necessarily be standardized. It is natural if you want to have a free uh, uninhibited, uh, uninhibited trading of uh, uh, an instrument, it is necessary that the instrument be standardized. So, that there is adequate liquidity in the market, you are able to any, any party wanting to sell uh, uh, the uh, instrument is able to locate a buyer with, adic uh, with ease uh, and that can only happen with if the, uh, if the instrument are standardized to some extent. So, it is very necessary in the context of futures that futures be standardized because of their uh, feature of being credibility. And secondly, there should be a mechanism for the elimination of default risk. Now, why is that necessary? That is necessary because when uh, in the context of futures, if you have if you want that future should be freely tradable, then uh, obviously a party A may transfer it to party is party A and B if they are in the initial parties to the contract A may transfer it to C and C may transfer to D without the concept uh, consent of B and that would create chaos in the market if the uh, if there was a significant default risk incorporated uh, uh, present in the futures contract. So, it is very necessary that uh, in order to facilitate smooth uninhibited uh, trading of futures that the futures contracts should be devoid of any kind of default risk. This is very fundamental. I will come back to this issue again in a minute, but for the moment it is uh, it is a necessary feature. It is a, a essential feature, essential ingredient that uh, the futures contract should number one be standardized and number two be de devoid of default risk in order that they can be traded uh, in an exchange with, uh, with comfort and ease. Okay. Now, we talk about some terminology. Lot size is the minimum quantity specified in the futures contract. Uh, it is not necessarily the, the case that one futures contract is written on uh, one unit of the underlying asset. There can be situations when a uh, large number of units of the underlying asset are covered by one futures contract. For example, uh, one futures contract on Great Britain pounds is of 62,500 pounds. Uh, uh, pounds. So, this is a lot size requirement. Lot size represents the number of units of the underlying that are covered by one futures con contract. That is uh, what is called a lot size. The value of the contract obviously is equal to the price per unit of the underlying into lo lot size. I repeat 
the value of the contract is equal to the price per unit of the underlying into lot size. Expiry is the last date up to which one can hold the futures, the maturity date, the terminal date, you may call it what you like. Margin to enter into a futures agreement, one has to deposit a margin, one has to deposit a margin amount which is calculated as a certain percentage of the contract value. Uh, the necessity of this margin also I will come back to it, but the, the for the moment whenever you want to trade in a futures contract, whenever you contact your brokers for taking a position in the futures contract, he will ask you to open a margin account and he will ask you to uh, uh, deposit a certain amount uh, based on the contract value and the terms of the exchange at which the trading is going to take place uh, uh, of your order at, as margin to be deposited in that margin account. Now, the settlement of the futures contracts can be either physical or cash. Physical settlement is quite simple. Physical settlement means that there will be actual delivery of the underlying asset by the party who is short in the futures contract to the party who is long in the futures contract. The party who is long in the futures contract will take the delivery. The party who is short in the futures contract will give the delivery of the underlying asset, this is physical settlement. However, there are some underlying assets, some underlying, particularly when we talk about commodities uh, which are not amenable to physical settlement. Uh, the physical settlement of such underlying assets may involve, may entail significant costs and as a result of which an alternative method of settlement is uh, sometimes adopted in exchanges in the context of certain underlying assets. How this is done is that on the date of maturity of the futures contract, uh, the, uh, the price of the futures contract is marked to the then prevailing spot price of the underlying asset and the differential between the previous day's futures price and the spot price on the date of maturity of the futures contract is marked or is transferred to the margin accounts in final settlement of the futures contract. Let me repeat, on the date of maturity of the futures contract, the contract is marked to the spot price of the underlying asset on that particular date that is on the date of maturity of the futures contract uh, and the difference between the previous settlement price and the settlement price that has been arrived at by marking the price to this uh, then prevailing spot price is uh, transferred to the margin accounts. So, that is how the uh, cash settlement, this is called cash settlement, that is how the cash settlement operates. Let me read it out for you. Uh, if a contract is cash settled, when the contract expires, margin um, account will be marked to market with the spot price at settlement. This is the important part. This is the, uh, this is the part that defines the settlement process the spot price that is. You mark the futures price to the current spot price on the date of maturity and the difference between the previous settlement price and this settlement price is transferred to the respective margin accounts of the parties to the contract. So, a settlement for profit and loss account on the final day of the contract. In the case of cash settlement, there is no need for physical delivery of the contract obviously of the underlying asset. Cash settlement can be done only if the contract specifies so. Now, this is important let me clarify to you that if a contract is to be cash settled, if a futures is to be cash settled, it must be mentioned or it must be a part of the contract ab initio that is when the contract is created, it must provide for cash settlement. Uh, otherwise, you cannot have a situation where one fine morning one of the parties or both the parties even agree that uh, the contract will be cash settled. If a contract is to be cash settled, it needs to be mentioned in the in the uh, issue document or the um, document by which the contract is created. Contract creation, futures contracts have a maximum of 3 month trading cycle. The near month, 1 month, the ne next month that is the 2 month and the far month that is the 3 month settlement. So, futures contracts have a maximum of 3 month trading cycle, the near month, the next month and the far month. New contracts are introduced by the exchange on the trading day following the exp expiry of the near month contract. So, on the very day the near month contract expires, the next day fresh contracts are introduced for trading by the relevant clearing house and that is how the cycle continues. The new contracts are introduced for a 3 month maturity. 
So, at any point in time you will have three contracts being traded the near month contract, the next month contract and the far month contract. As soon as this near month contract reaches its maturity the next day a fresh contract uh, will be uh, created and uh, released for trading and this new contract will now become the far month contract, the next month contract will now be the near month contract and the and the far month contract will now become the next month contract. So, this way the trading cycle is continued and at any point in time there will be three contracts available for trading in the market one near month, one next month and one far month duration respectively. Now, there is the issue of default risk I will come back to it after the break. Thank you.